Oh, yeah. All right, so oh, let's make a... Oh, a there's a lady recording it. Yeah, no, me. <laughs> let's make a, a formal interaction for our listeners. Uh, good afternoon, team. My name is Claudio. I'm calling you from Washington, D.C. Uh, from the Swiss Fairfax City, we're very humble and grateful that Tim Blake accepted our invitation to our show. Uh, Tim, welcome to the show, man. Hi. So let's start from the beginning. So with all the stuff that is going on with the with the pandemic and inability to tour and go outside that much and, uh, you know, affecting your life, your family, your career as a musician, how you how you how you holding up, man? How you doing, man? <laughs> with the pandemic, well, you have. I mean, it's a very strange time. Yeah, because when it started, uh, I was very much uh, joined up with my very old friend Dave Brock. In playing with Hawkwind, celebrating 50, we were having a ball, and it's been. Somebody <laughs> unplugged the thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was unplugged uh, straight away, and um, now, uh, for me, who lives in France in particular, uh, as far as working for Hawkwind is concerned, it's all down to the way people will open the borders um it's become necessary as a uh, uh working traveler uh to become vaccinated to have codes to have things on your phone to have all this equipment to travel but we still are not free to travel so you know one just sits here and waiting you know it was, was this the end of the, the 50 year journey or is this the beginning of the next one i don't know yeah yeah i i, I understood and it's difficult for everybody but well i'm you're alive hopefully gigs coming your way you know you have very good news you have a long way we we want to see tim blake for another 50 years man you know? Well, you know, uh, who knows, you know, uh, I have no idea, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I where, have no idea. Were you, born like in, in a, you, were know? you born like in a musical family, Tim? Were, were, you, began, were you born like in a musical family? <clears throat> when you began playing piano or taking piano lesson or guitar lesson or whatever? No, ah, well. Now, in my family, uh, yeah. On my father's side, for instance, uh, you were either soldier or priest or both. Yeah. <laughs> so I became both by being a musician, you see. Yeah. And um, uh, I, 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 I had two accesses to a little musical education. Uh, one uh, as a, a choir boy, you know, singing in church. Yeah. Which I was quite good at, and I got awards for, and uh, that got you learning to read one line of music off a piece of paper, which helps. Not much, but it helps. And when yeah. I went on to a higher level of schooling, I was very lucky to be able to uh, learn music with Derek Bourgeois, who was a composer. And uh, Derek Bourgeois was a specialist in uh, brass instruments, and he had me playing the trumpet, strangely enough. Uh, and so from kind of 14, you know, 13, 14, to 16 I was taking regular trumpet lessons and that had got me playing in a school orchestra which is an experience uh, and in a school band yeah, which wow. was a good way to get out of too much military training and uh, uh, and generally 
uh, working with, with Derek was very inspiring for people who had, uh, you know, for instance, he told me never to try to play piano. He said, it's too late. You know, uh, <laughs> it's too late. You should have been learning when you were six, you know, but you weren't. So uh, forget it. So I didn't bother with the piano, really. And um, I've had to come to terms with keyboards because of synthesizer playing. Sure. But, yeah. you know, I, I first got into synthesizers as a myriad of knobs and buttons, you know. What can we do? Ooh, ooh. <laughs> you know, but uh, uh, and then there's, you know, 50 years after all of this, there's this joke which Dave and I have, which is uh, that when I was 17, I wanted to play the guitar in Hawkwind, you see. Wow. And uh, there was no way I was going to get to play the guitar in Hawkwind. But all these years later, after a strange flash with Lemmy and Dave playing solos, Dave said to me, well, you always wanted to play the guitar, get on with it. So I do, you know. Yeah. And, wow. um, now it's... Uh, it's funny, really. It's like a full circle. You know, I mean, even if nothing else happens, come on, we've had a good time. Of course. Well, so, yeah. where, what? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I live not opulently, but comfortably the way things are. Okay? I mean, no real need. Um, I've kind of settled my problems with the music business by taking part as little as possible <laughs> in, in what they do, you know? So... I'm a happy man, you know, if it, if it was all about the last 50 years, fantastic, you know. Of course, you if know. It's I'm, about the next. Uh, and people, like of, me, you know, people like me, people like me and the audience like the music, so I'm I'm glad you did it, man, so. You, you know, uh, but uh, I don't have any anger or something, you know, it's not a need for me to go out anymore. Touch. I understand. What kind of yeah, what kind uh, of music, be, before before joining Gone? What what kind of music were you listening to? Was were you listening to rock, electronic music, Genesis? Before before, before, before joining Gone. Yeah, before be, when you were seventeen, eighteen. Yeah. What what kind of music were you listening to? Well, you see, for a start, everybody my age who's English. Huh? Yeah. Kind of woke up. I don't know what year it was. We can look it up on Google if you like. No. Uh, to a TV series. Yeah. Called Doctor Who. Ah, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Now, the theme music from Doctor Who, which wasn't in itself fabulous, had been performed and realized, I believe that's the term, in music concrete by Delia Derbyshire. And this rather banal theme became the ultimate piece of space music ever. You know? And this is when I'm a young kid, you know? Uh, 11 or 12 or something. What's this, you know? And for instance, when I started using theremin, yeah, my first remark was, "Why didn't I get one of these when I was a kid?" You know, because I would be a master of it by now. <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, then you got 
in the electronics world, you've got music from Luciano Berio, for instance, which was quite amazing and pretty psychedelic. We were getting interested in psychedelic music then. Uh, and, uh, and of course, it's impossible not to mention Switched on Bach. Yeah, of course. Because once you'd heard Switched on Bach, you realized that the adventure with synthesizers would only be limited by your imagination. You know, and that was it. You know, crack. I had to go that way. Um, Hawkwind formed at that time. Uh, Dipmick was going mad with his uh, uh, generator. You know, yes, sir. he's part of my inspiration too. Well, perhaps we inspired each other because we were actually living together at one point. You know, and. Um, uh, but I was the sound man, you know? I was the man who was doing sound for all these bands. Yeah. And uh, my invitation to go to France to join Gong yeah. was based on me being a sound man, but it immediately changed to me being a musician. Yeah, musician, you betcha. And uh, by the way, before we go into Gong, you, you mentioned Switch on Bach. Uh, have you ever met uh, Wendy, Wendy Carlos? No. No, no you never. Know. I've been a Moog user, uh, the mini Moog I had, which was a Bob Moog one, you know, uh, yeah. RD Moog Limited, not Moog Music Inc. Uh, and I've used a modular Moog. I haven't owned it, but I've used it. But despite this, um, I'm not the best friend of Moog Inc. I don't know why, because I'm associated with uh, EMS synthesizers so heavily. I think <coughs> you know this is a this is a uh, Bob Moog built Big Briar theremin. It's got yeah. antique value actually. Uh, I want to get the new Caravox because Moog knows I've modified my theremin, and they've produced very good ways of doing this themselves and I'd love to try it and my theremin friend uh, Doric Chrysler she says you'll love it you know but she's a friend of mine they look after her, but they don't look after me which is a shame but you know uh yeah you know I mean obviously I would have enjoyed meeting Carlos uh far too exacting musician for someone like me I'm far too uh, I mean, Peter Zanofiev died last uh, last month. Uh, <laughs> I understand. Uh, three weeks. So you... and someone brought out a film uh, about Delia Derbyshire, where there were interviews with Peter and with David Vorhaus and with Brian Hodgson, all who worked with her, uh, and they were fictional reproductions of episodes in their life, which was very strange. And Zanofiev comes along, and when he mentions David Voice, and then, then along came David Voice. He was he was like a hippie, uh, you know. Yes, but of course we were. He didn't really like us, you know. I don't know if uh, you know what Peter liked is that we bought his synthesizers which allowed him to spend money on his computer studio, right? I got caught at half past six in the morning with Basil Brooks in his computer studio, having hijacked it, uh, which I went up in his esteem, but I think the closest I ever got to Peter Zanofius was that I would eat the very, very hot chutney on his EMS lunches. You know, because uh, he used to look at that and you know, see if you would survive eating the very hot one, you know. But, sure. Yeah. I understand. So, when you know, you... He, but as, he, as musicians, there wasn't much interaction between the um, classical boys 
the which Carlos definitely was yeah. the contemporary boys which Zinoviev definitely was and the hippies which I definitely was you know and uh, I, I accept understand. that so so you 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 went for if when you joined Ron, you first you were like a sound person right like a sound engineer people you know, calling you to help here to help there and then you became you know part of uh in gone in the in in the early 70s right was that correct well yeah um it's 50 years ago this year yeah wow yeah it's amazing huh? right. uh 50 years ago this year right i was a sound engineer uh my exploits had helped hawkwin to form uh, yeah. uh, and i worked with a little company of groups so there was always a sound needed somewhere you know and uh, i was cheap and cheerful as they say uh, and uh, meeting a lot of people uh, and in particular meeting both Kevin Ayers uh, and uh, the soft machine uh, in particular Robert yeah. uh, and this somehow led to me being invited to Marquis Studios to help David and Pierre Lattes finish an album David was making called Banana and we did two days work and the album's finished and David says, well, would you, you know, I'm going back uh, the day after tomorrow. Do you want to come back and uh, do sound with Gong? Wow. So I went back with David and, uh, but in fact, since David has been gone, Although his sound man had effectively left the group, the assistant sound man had definitely moved in as the sound engineer. And it would have been ridiculous to spoil this, but David hadn't been thinking properly, I don't know, I, you know. Anyway, Phoenix and I looked after the band together for a little while. And I actually profited as Gong had its own sound system. I sold some sound equipment I had in England and I bought my first synthesizer. Now, <coughs> when Pip Pyle came to join Gong, uh, I think it's fair to say Pip and I knew each other. We didn't really appreciate each other from the word go. And uh, I drifted off and uh, did a bit of this there and a bit of that there and ended up in Paris where it was good to be one of the first people around with the synthesizer. And uh, I was doing a few sessions. I made a couple of very strange contemporary records, very strange indeed, but that doesn't mean not good, you know quite proud of them. Um, but, Dewey Fu by Pascal Dufar. This is a uh, this is a collector's item, so but it's so weird, you know. But you know, having done things with orchestras, with uh, uh, jazz, with opera singers and electronics. I mean, it was a very adventurous time. Uh, I went to Japan as a touring musician. Yeah. for the first time and uh, then by the time I came back to Japan I was kind of making bits of tape most of which is available um, there's quite a lot of 1972 in edits on uh, the cherry red lighthouse box set uh, uh, which is Advertisement here, yeah, quickly. Uh... Right, let me, yeah, this, this little box set. Of course, uh, I, of this... course I, I have it. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, there's quite a bit of seventy-two. They've got all their dates wrong. But... And of course, we were distributing music uh, completely outside of the industry, as it were. Um, <coughs> Uh, or cassette form, you know, form, yeah. and but at the same time when I was in Paris, uh, my life partner at that time uh, was uh, someone who was quite a lot older than me and had been a contemporary dancer and she would in fact been a star of contemporary dance in as much that she was a partner with Maurice Béjar and danced all his first ballets with him, uh, which meant she was also a great friend of Pierre Henri. Wow. So I met Pierre Henri. I actually sold him a synthesizer. And when he died, this synthesizer was always on display in his studio. I don't think it was plugged in. He didn't play synthesizer, but you know, but uh, uh, so I did were, was able to catch up. Gotcha. Yeah. This first world of electronic music, which was music concrete, that yeah. had alerted us from Doctor Who, because apart from Schaefer and Henri, no one else was really good at music concrete, apart from Delia Derbyshire, who was the best. Absolutely, know? absolutely. So you know, in, in, in Gone, you know, you, you, you appear on the three albums, right? Or the Radio Nome, Invisible Trilogy, where I think they're Flying Teapot, Angels, X, and you, and it's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of controversy. When it gets up to everything else we did, you know, there's 13 CDs in there. Yeah. You know, so uh, I think there's one I don't play on, you know, but, uh, you know, we did, we did a lot of playing. Uh, so it, in it, those. It, it's a lot of controversy on the Australian album, you know, who did what was Alan in ball, Smith in ball, were you writing most of the time? What's, what happened? Well, there's a lot well, of controversy. No, there's two sides of the story of Gong. Okay. One that the people who run Gong and profit from it uh, prefer. <laughs> And one that I just lived. And for a start, there is no trilogy. What do you mean by that? I mean, well, I mean, they've been very clever on the Virgin box. Yeah. They don't say it's the trilogy box set. They say, gone the Virgin years. You know, which is a good idea. Because there is no relationship, and I feel absolutely free to say this because I'm a composer on both. Gotcha. But there is no relationship between Flying Teapot and Angel's Egg and you. There's a relationship overdubbed into both albums, into all three albums uh, of, shall we say, Angel's Egg and You by David to make them a trilogy. Oh, I see, I understand. Now. But yeah. they are not. Okay? Uh, now then, there's a whole obscure reason for this. The Gong story will never be clear, but it seems that at the same time as we signed a record contract with Virgin, which was in between Angel's Egg and you, 
David had already signed a record contract with a friend of his for a trilogy. So David was <laughs> trying to run a number on everybody, Virgin, Gong, and everybody, in order to fulfill an engagement he had made with somebody else about a trilogy. And, but first off, if you, let's look at these three albums. Uh, Flying Teapot, I was contacted by David round about the summer of 1972 saying oh i've heard your cassette and this and is it true you're playing live concerts i said well very rare but when we can we have a go at it yes you know he said well why don't you come back and play with the band and then at the beginning of next year we're going to make this album okay so move back to songs playing and we're dealing with a logical suite to Camembert Electric, you know, with the songs. They're all really good, but it's a very much a David album, apart from the fact that the actual riff of Flying Teapot comes from Francis Mose. I had to rewrite a bit of that for Didier at his demand, uh, so that he could play a more interesting solo but um you know we're dealing with alan mose alan and alan smith music throughout flying teapot apart from the octave doctor of the crystal machine which is obviously something i did by myself in my corner and uh but a hundred percent good okay and concise but the thing is gone broke up during that record i mean not a little bit but completely and by the end of that recording session gong was me and didier malherbe you know which is a bit weird now we went back to songs and we called in steve who had already been uh, going through the uh, preliminaries with and uh, Pierre rocked up by himself you know just drawn in by a magnet and then a month or two later David sent us Mike Owlett okay and uh, that worked like a bomb but during this period, we wrote Angel's Egg. Now, there can be no trilogy because there is no liaison between Flying Teapot and Angel's Egg. It just isn't there. Musically, it's, you know, I mean, what I think is so good is the music we wrote at that period is absolutely clearly identifiable as gong music. Right. You know, and it could have been written with David, it just wasn't, you right. know. And, uh, and David has actually tried his best to make much of it his own over the years, until he died, uh, which is in my opinion, a signification of how well we did in, uh, in, in being gone without him, you know. <laughs> uh, in a way, I suppose I like Angel's Egg best because we recorded this in our house, okay, with a mobile studio. Um, sometimes playing in the garden and sometimes in your bedroom and so you know and the drums okay in the music room you know because they had screens around them and stuff like that but uh when i hear that record 
without getting involved in the songs or the music or what the sound it has reminds me of that house i see and i suppose that is the definition of a good recording isn't it if it sounds like like those people in that place then it's well recorded you know so i think we may have had a great success in capturing time with that right? absolutely man no i, I that's uh, that's now and then now it's clear to me that's a very good answer and then you end up leaving gong and then you well, put this yeah you know, we made we made we made you yeah of um, course after that right and um you it, it, it is talking musicology here is even more interesting because everybody says it's the best music we ever wrote is it I, that's what people say i have no opinion i can't yeah you know uh some of it's the most enjoyable to play that is sure uh, um but how we wrote this again it's got to be said uh you was written by uh steve pierre mike didier and me and then overdubbed <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> true which is why i wasn't there afterwards you know <laughs> yeah but um instead of saying it would be nice to do this or it would be nice to do that we started to create music based on where we didn't get on now, the absolute perfect example of this is the cycles gliss. Right? Now, Steve and I, at that time, would have been very happy to play music for an infinite number of hours, which featured one note only. And we'd probably be having a, a strong 4-4 four, four beat, which is probably why we get called grandparents of techno. That is Steve actually plays techno music. You know, I mean, uh, but um, that wasn't necessary to everybody's liking. DDA could be incredibly well spoken in the way he explains how jazz and how the jazz soloist that the saxophonist is has to find scales between the changing chords huh? and how boring it is to play one's head off on one note you know and next to that pierre and mike would complain about the simplicity of beats you know uh i suppose the best example of uh composed tempo in uh, you would be the riff of sprinkling of clouds which they came up with which is uh one two three four five two two three four five three two three four five one two three one two three four five six it's still 24 but that's where the accents come from. Dum da 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 dum da 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 dum da 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 da. You know, and so we came up with the cycles bliss, which is constantly going up in minor thirds and changing time signature every time round. Ah, and this is you know. Uh, our disagreements producing incredibly new music i mean it was a it, it was a great i think it's a, a major experience for everybody involved 
you know. Uh, I see, well, unfortunately, there's not a lot of us, <laughs> uh, but I see Mike, who went on to be a record producer and appears to be very much a retired record producer who goes and plays with friends from time to time. I see Didier, who did take up on a completely new career after Gong, you know, with the Du Duke and its fabulous career and its career here in France. And I say Steve, who's been uh, messing around with psychedelic dance music for a few years, has now got back to playing Steve Hillage music again. Wow. You know, but it's, but it's still the 70s music, you know, so that's not progressing. So I think we, you'll find that um, with the exception of Didier, we all came to a musical climax there, you know. I mean, Pierre, before he died, was saying, we've got to get back to that space, you know. Uh, now, who knows what would have been if it had been different, but it wasn't. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, you is the most, uh, you know, but I, I really don't see the trilogy in there. I understand, and no, no, no. thank you for clarifying that. You know, that, that, you know because uh, I it, suppose it's a, there is a, there is a trilogy. Uh, it's from David to after David in three steps, but in fact, it's in one. You know, and that's fine, Teapot. You know, no, I don't see where the trilogy is at all, and uh, I find this very confusing actually. It was, it was to me, that's what the research was asking. And then after that, uh, going, going on in your career, and uh, Tim, you, you, you decided to leave uh, Gone and, and, and began your solo career uh, under the name of Crystal Machine, and you, you released in 77 Crystal Machine and 78 uh, Blake uh, New Jerusalem, which are both unbelievable albums. Yes, yeah, well, yes, I, you know, I, uh, I made them. I had to live with them. They'll do. <laughs> what you use? It, what was the reason of using now? You know, Tim Blake's new album and using, and using uh, Crystal Machine was there a special reason using the Crystal Machine name or. Well. As I was saying. The, the, the pre gong stuff or the, or the you know in these six to nine months I was traveling about in France you know uh, the last six of them I spent in Paris you know, right? yeah. now Paris is um, like any city to the penniless artist yeah uh, uh, it's always very hard because you have to find somewhere to play. And I was introduced to a friend called Philip Denny, who used to be a disc jockey and had tape record tape recorders. Wow, you know. And uh, so I had my synthesizer set up at his place, you know. Yeah. And uh, we wanted a name, so we came up with Crystal Machine Studio. Wow. Yeah. And and it, and it goes in function to what we would do. I think the night we came up with the name, we were playing with a Le Parc light sculpture into which we had replaced the light source with a laser. No. You know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know. And we had the, you know, we invented the crystal machine in our head, so we invented it on paper too. You know. I understand. And after, so that's the reason that you use the name. And is is it the crystal machine album and um, New Jerusalem? From your point of view, uh, the the best you ever done, or I mean, at the time and. Because you did, you did well in sales. So you were selling records a lot, right? At the time, they were. Um, I, 
You see, what was really brilliant about Crystal Machine yeah. was the work with Patrice. Now, I will send you uh, the only bits of uh, memory I have, uh, uh, documents I have on this. Yeah. Gotcha. But, um, it was very avant garde. Oh, it yeah. was before you find any of this work from anybody else. Uh, but it's not really involved with the records. So I think the best Crystal Machine record they could have been would have been a video disc. You know, already some of the live stuff on the Crystal Machine album, I they were images for that. You know, why aren't they with it? You know, I uh, so you can't say it's the best you ever done because finally, it's only the, one aspect of the whole is shown. Sure. And what I think, I mean, best I have no opinion. Uh, what piece of music do I like best of me is the title of the century. Oh, I see. Yeah. I, I like the uh, I like the live version in Amsterdam of Tide of the Century with John Philip because it's a pretty good example of what we like doing. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um. And what about what about new new Jerusalem? Yeah, post batteries and post lasers and all yeah. of this, but, but yeah. you know. What what about the new Jerusalem? Are you were you happy with the work? And uh, you did okay on sales, right? You were selling a lot of vinyl at the time before CDs, right? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, uh, uh, it sold for forty three years. Yeah, still selling. Yeah, you know. Oh, yeah, you know. Uh, it's still in print. It's still available. I mean, uh, I no longer manage my records. Really? Uh, no, I prefer to live in this lovely house. <laughs> so I exchanged at one point my copyrights for a lot of money, like is now the the, the mode and. Uh, I live in a lovely house, you know. I I understand. Uh, I understand. And but, then um, after, go ahead. And then um, with that, you you were touring Europe, uh, Japan, everywhere. You you know you were you were going places at the yeah, time. Yeah, but it was very hard. You see, um, in in nineteen seventy nine, I, I I suppose I gave up because. Well, you know, we got to Glastonbury, right? Yeah. We had Peter Gabriel as support. What? Yes. Wow. <laughs> uh, and after Glastonbury, Patrice and I went on to Holland and we did... Uh, four or five concerts without John Philip in Holland. And then I got back to Paris and it was the 14th of July. And I rocked up at my girlfriend's house And I had to do some last accounting. And she put the telly on in the evening. And there in Mondio vision, this Jean Michel Jar lit up by friends of mine. People I work with. I thought, oh fuck this. If if this is down to how much can you spend? I'm going to lose. You know, uh, gone business was very badly exploited. 
And the result was any money I was making personally uh, out of crystal machines, like writing the music, for instance, it was all going off to pay gong debts. So there was I trying to go around the world with laser beams and shit like this. And I managed quite well, as you say, you know, we got to Japan. Yeah. We got to, we got to Glastonbury headlining in 79. You know, we did these things. Uh, we went to Spain, we went to Holland, we, you know, uh, but I did my sums and I spent a whole year on the road and I paid everybody what I promised them they'd get paid, you know, and I'd lost everything else, you know. And I said to my girlfriend, fucking hell, if a group with a manager phones me up now and proposes me to go and play, I'm out of this, you know. And the phone rang. And it was Douglas, Hawkwind's manager. <laughs> so, you know, I just went up, you know, I couldn't afford to do any more, you know. Uh, understand, yeah. Uh, understand. All, all, all the, uh, all the profit that we could possibly make doing crystal machine instead of being invested into becoming the world's most incredible new age sound and light show uh, was being sucked off to pay gong debt and all of a sudden we had a guy selling 60 million albums uh, showing that he could afford to buy everybody who worked with me and he did <laughs> everybody but one he never got patrice no he got patrice built machines yes but he never got patrice yeah. no but uh yeah i don't meet john michel jar much in my life but when we do we have a good laugh <laughs> that's good and then you uh you know i think i was read somewhere that um you're one of the first performance uh you know to bring sort of electronic instrument uh into like a live setting as well as um the use of laser lighting right is that correct at the time yeah, yeah well that's what i was saying uh you were asking me about the Christmas Machine New Jerusalem albums yeah. and, uh, uh, and, and what I say about them, what a shame they are not multimedia albums. Yeah, it's too bad. Which we could show what we were doing because we were doing, well, it was quite complicated, it was good. It was good, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And as you say, it was also groundbreaking. Oh, absolutely. You know, playing it live. Yeah music and uh, listen uh the using a uh, laser lighting was way way ahead of the time i suppose right at the time yes and uh, i mean uh, with the loss of exclusivity that hit us quite badly in 79 you know where do we go now? Uh, uh, Patrice, he went away for a few years. We did the first Hawkwind show together. You know, it was the 79 tour. It was kind of Hawkwind with Crystal Machine because I would do a New Jerusalem, a lighthouse thing in the middle of the set with Patrice. And then Lighthouse would become a Hawkwind number and we would uh, finish yeah. the Hawkwind act, you know. And he went to Polynesia and did a bit of laser uh, out there. I didn't find it very interesting, came back. And then he 
came across a new technique which has got nothing to do with show business at all but is of illuminating buildings and this has been a, this has been a parachuted success 30 years ago patrice was on his knees uh, to the lyon town council i just want to light two buildings before christmas you know i mean it's an experiment fuck it you know and they finally let him do it now the international light festival at lyon attracts about four million people wow you know uh that, that's been a serious 30 years too right wow. obviously it's pandemic struck as well i don't know if this will happen this year didn't last but uh you know the leon thing was in fact and now you can go to university and learn how to illuminate a building like patrice in fact you can go to university and get a phd talking about crystal machine but we don't <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, where are you with you with with Hawkwind? You you been uh, you were in seventy nine and, and nineteen eighty, I think, and and then rejoined them on kind of several occasions, right? On and off, one off shows. Yeah. Well, you know what? What you have to understand is this: before I went to France, okay we were talking about this earlier and I said I was doing the sound for uh, the groups of, uh, of a management company you know like a stables uh, and one night it was uh, a concert for high tide which is a very remarkable group which was sadly ahead of its time and got a bit ignored but very very talented group that featured the violin player Simon House who has also played with uh, Hawkwind with David Bowie with a number of people okay and um, we had no support for this concert and no star either okay so when i'm setting up my pa these guys come and say hello uh, we're trying to form a group and i should have said so what fuck off but no i said well why don't you come along and uh, perform this evening and this is the people who are going to become hawkwind wow so i have a relationship with this group since an hour before it was started yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah. and, and uh, uh you know dave and i we don't always agree but we're friends for 52 years you know that's a long time and so uh, uh i came back and did 79 and 80 with hawkwind but uh we were going to fall out because I didn't want to be on the road at that time and uh, I had something else to do and we were to fall out and then uh, when it came round to do this orchestra thing which wasn't in itself good but it was a great chance to be fooling about with Lemmy and Dave at the same time uh, you know i then started to become a regular contributor and after my car accident in 2004 uh 2007 dave and chris were in my house saying no 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 you're not staying here you're getting on the road you know and uh, i've been working with them more or less all the time ever since you know and what lovely things we've done I've been to Japan with Hawkwind. I've been to uh, uh, Australia with Hawkwind. Uh, I've played the Royal Albert Hall with Hawkwind, which was an old joke because Dave used to busk the queue outside back in the day. So, uh, yeah, I'll take you to Royal Albert Hall, Tim. You'll see where we went. You know, 
We did it. Yeah, fantastic. Wow. Uh, Playing at the Royal Albert Hall is it's amazing, man. Yeah. It's amazing venue. It's, and it's 50, amazing. 50 for 50 years. It's man. a 50 story. Yeah. 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 52. Wow, my God, man. That's amazing. You have done uh, your your discography contain uh, I think more than 20, 25 titles, right? You your discography contain over 25 titles. I mean, you have done a lot of stuff, right? Oh, well, 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 my, my discography. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't even, I haven't put it up to date for a few years. Uh, yeah, it's more than that, I think. Yeah, yeah, 25, 30, something like that. In between. It's amazing. It's a lot. I mean, there's, it's a lot of work, man. I mean, there's, there's records I don't even know about. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, as soon as you mention the word gone, <laughs> you get surprises. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. Right. Gong is not, unfortunately, honest business. It's strange because it's now in the hands of people who I would have first have considered to be perfectly honest, but I don't know. No, that's that's the way David wanted it. <laughs> Bunch of people. Yeah. If you, if any, looking back at your career, if any particular. Is there any particular concert that you that you will never forget, if you will, or is the the, the 1979 uh, Glastonbury Festival? Is the, if looking back at your career, is one or two concerts that you say, "Man, that was right." Well, back in 1972, yeah, during the summer. We were part of a touring show that had a group by a French singer, blues singer called Alan Jack, which wasn't called the Alan Jack Organization. They called themselves Vimanas at that time. And a French actress, singer, Valerie Lagrange, and Myself and Philip as Crystal Machine and another American uh, folk singer. And we were trying to get gigs as a tour. And we had a booking in Belfort, which was right out in the east, you know, almost in Germany. Uh, the Territoire de Belfort. And we, uh, we drive out there and we set up our gear and it's like round about the time that people should be arriving at the concert that we discovered that none of the advertising we had paid for had been done and we actually got nobody in uh, not one ticket sold and a guy we had invited, a local press journalist, came up and explained what had happened. Now, this is a record. That's the only time we've had the possibility of playing a concert to no one, and you know, not even one person. And so we never played, of course, we just packed up and left. But uh, you don't forget that, okay? Um, there's a concert with Gong which I've written about in my memoir, 1974, uh, we had just written the U set, right? And we were about to go back on the road and David had had us as usual, rehearsing a set essentially of David Allen songs. <laughs> and uh, no, you can't kill me for the uh, 
20th year running, you know, and everything. And the first gig came and we all woke up in the morning and got ready and no sign of David. And as well, actually sitting, even Didier, the slowest man in the world, in the truck, ready to go, still no David, who suddenly arrived saying, oh man, I've lost my voice in meditating. I can't come to the gig and saying he can't come to the gig. And instead of trying to persuade him to come, we just said, OK, don't worry, I'm pissed off. Right? And so in the bus, we're saying, well, look, let's change the set. Let's play this new music. <laughs> and it was in Birmingham City Hall. Yeah. And uh, we drive into Birmingham and the road is there and are set up waiting for us for sound check. And uh, Venus, where's David? Oh, oh. You know, and uh, we come off stage and uh, I go on stage by myself, which is, we started like this. We've one note, of course, and then Steve comes along and uh, joins with me and uh, slowly people are coming onto the stage and it's the Omri for the very, very, very first time. Da 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 And we play it all the way through to the da 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 And there was total silence in Birmingham City Hall full. And the total silence continues. And at a certain moment, Mike bursts out in laughter. And that breaks the spell. Oh, fuck, we have to clap now. <laughs> yeah, uh, but absolute total silence for a minute after the first time the Ohm riff was played. We were just looking at each other going, oh, fuck. What have we done there? You know, uh, <laughs> you don't forget that it doesn't happen. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, so from the worst to possibly the best, you know. That's right. That's right. Man, but every gig is, is fabulous, you know. I mean, I'm so grateful to Dave and Chris for having me for some of the Hawkwind gigs we've done. Some of them have been grotesque, but some of them you're really proud to be there. Yeah. You need you need to write like a uh, Tim. You need to write like a book with all the stories that you have, man. Well, I, I am, but writing is not what I do best. <laughs> because you have so many stories, man, to tell. Writing is not what I do best, so you know. But uh, the, it's noted down. Uh, yeah. That's something I am working on. I've been, I've been doing a lot more writing during lockdown. All these people, they send you their music, think you're going to make records with them for free. <sighs> I don't do that, you know. Do you want to make a record with me? You bring me over, you know. We work together, we make recordings, but I don't just help people out like that. And so I've, I've been translating books uh, from French into English and things like this. Yeah. Are you, are you working on new uh, material? Well, no, I've been working on writing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to get my writing better to finish my book. Yeah. You know. I got you. I understand. Right. Do you, uh, do you, do you miss uh, touring and then playing bar, playing live uh, for people? Is. Well, yes, you know, I mean, as I said, my last time out, right, uh, it's simple. I was on the road with Hawkwind in October 2019, right? Yeah. We finished at the Royal Albert Hall. Wow. 
agarrado. Né? With a friend, we went to Amsterdam, must have been January, to see Steve playing. And it's quite funny because Steve plays with a group who call themselves God, which is, makes it even funnier. And we go to see Steve play impeccably uh, in Paradiso, which had kind of 250 people in it. So it was a bit dephasing from the Royal Albert Hall to Paradiso. But we loved it because we went for a weekend in Amsterdam to see Steve, you know. And Amsterdam has all sorts of pleasures, okay? Now, um, I came back here and we went into lockdown. No, and I've been uh, to uh, I've been out twice since. <laughs> wow! You know, I went to see the screening of a film last week where <coughs> I've done the voiceover. That's all. You know. So, do I miss? Yeah, of course. You know. Think concert, wow, Royal Albert Hall, wow, uh, take me somewhere really bad, then I won't miss it anymore. But <laughs> for the moment, of course I miss. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a funny guy. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, Tim, that's all the time that I have for now, but it was, uh, it was very, very nice talking to you. And uh, hopefully when I'm in London or France, we can... We can, we can get together. We'd like to invite you to dinner or something, man. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, uh, London, I'm never in London. You're never going back, no? No, I'm never in London. Well, well, yeah. it's, how, uh, far, how far are you, are you from Paris? It's about 500K, but 450K, but uh, it's quite quick by train. Yeah. By train, yeah. Yeah, I'm quite sure. Oh, and, uh, but, you know, it's very uh, quick by train. We have very good trains in this country. Yeah. You know, it's it's one stop, one hour twenty six from the train station. It's forty five kilometers away. Bet you, bet you. Bet you. And, uh, but, and, um, and def definitely, I want to send you an email because I'm interested in um, um, getting some of the boxes and some of the other CDs I don't have. You know, signed by you. So definitely, I'm I'm interested in buying some of the stuff, man. Yeah. Well, you know, you're going to have to cut this and edit it, but I'll be interested to hear what you make of it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. Have a, you know, have My a great pleasure. And have a, thank you very much for all the, all the good music, man. Okay. Thank My you. My pleasure. Thank you. Take it easy. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. Thank you.